which probably puts me on some kind of list, which is the FBI being well, completely out of order yet again. I mean, I, there's, two, there's fundamentally two different parts of that. So if we want to address the constitutionality of it, I mean, law enforcement, local, state, and federal law enforcement have been involved in these types of operations for I, maybe over 100 years. I don't know how long they, how far back it goes. But I mean, if it's unconstitutional, like, where are the cases, right? Has anything gone to the Supreme Court where the Supreme Court has said you're not allowed to engage in this type of investigatory behavior anymore? It doesn't seem like it. So I think that the constitutional question is, is, is a side argument. I, I guess maybe we can disagree with the judge's interpretation of the Constitution, but at that point, are you even being constitutional at that point? I think it gets a little bit strange. Aside from the constitutional argument, then you have, like, the general question of can we give people an opportunity to commit a crime and if they jump on that opportunity, should we punish them? I don't think, it, I don't think it's like precog levels. I don't think we're at minority report. Um, I, I guess it's a separate conversation, but I mean, like, sh if, if you give somebody the opportunity to commit a crime, and then they jump on the opportunity to commit the crime, I just don't understand why you wouldn't think it would be appropriate to punish those people for attempting to commit the crimes. Um, again, like the most obvious example I can think of before is like, is all the Chris Hansen stuff bad because there wasn't actually a 13 or 14 year old on the other end? Or more reasonably, when we think of that stuff, do we think, well, actually it's okay because it could have been a 13 or 14 year old on the other end? Can the three letter agencies be trusted? No, there, saved you two hours, let's drink. Let's introduce these guys, our moderator for this one. He is the co-founder of Myth Informed. They began as Mythicist Milwaukee and they've just grown and evolved. He is the chair of finance and outreach and a podcast host. He is the re one of the reasons we're all here today. Uh, he is one of the smartest and greatest dudes I know. Brian Edward! All right, this cool Persian cat is a YouTuber who has schooled tens of millions of people with his man on the street interviews and his infamous water jug. The only thing more nuanced than this bro's politics is his gym routine. And I don't really know if he has a name, if I should call him Nuance, Mr. Bro. Either way, put your hands together for Nuance Bro. She is an actress from Canada. It's okay, we all have flaws. You may know her from Battlestar Galactica or from about 7,000 different true crime documentaries. I've seen all of them, hit up that Q&A. Um, she is now an advocate for reforming the prison and criminal justice systems. Welcome to the stage, blonde bombshell, Nikki Klein! So I gotta tell you guys, today I was talking to my mom and told her I was coming here and she was like, who's speaking? I was like, oh, you know, Blair, Carrie, Destiny. She was like, oh, Destiny. Now, is that a stripper or a drag queen? And I was like, he's neither, but he is one of the original pioneers of streaming and an internet icon. Welcome to the stage, Stephen Destiny Bonnell. This next guy, he is the esteemed author of wonderful research papers such as Human Reactions to Rape Culture and Queer Performativity at Urban Dog Parks in Portland, Oregon. As well as Going Through the Back Door, Challenging Straight Male Homo Hysteria and Transphobia Through Receptive Penetrative Sex Toy Use, based on my life story. He's also known for giving Dr. Phil an aneurysm. Did you see that shit? I thought his head was gonna roll off. Um, he is the king of the anti-CRT movement. We all have a little bit of a crush on him. Put your hands together for James fucking Lindsay! Thank you, Mikey, for those impressive introductions. Um, I'm definitely, I, I can say for certain that I'm not the uh, smartest person in the room, but I am definitely competing, or at least a candidate for the most hungover. We did stay out quite a bit late last night. Um, what I want to uh, talk about today is the three letter agencies. And we've got a, a distinguished panel. I, I appreciated the introductions. But it seems to me that the, the three letter agencies have had a bit of a problem of late. If when we're talking about General Flynn and the lack of a, uh, a case there. Um, Governor Whitmer's kidnapping plat. 
and January 6th. I wanted to read the uh, stated mission of the FBI, which is a three-letter agency that we'll talk about. There's been some other three-letter agencies that we will uh, also talk about. The CDC comes to mind, the FDA, the DOJ. But the actual mission statement of the uh, FBI is to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution. But I want to know if their tactics, um, in fact, accommodate that point of view, because I'm not a criminal justice expert, but I think I'm allowed to be shocked when the, I find out that the FBI has 12 of, of the 26 people in the Wolverine plot, 12 of which are FBI agents. Now, I'm not a math major, I know James is, but that appears to me almost half. What's your take on the Whitmer plot I want to get into, and do you think it was entrapment, or is this incompetence, or, or, or am I completely wrong? And uh, Destiny, go I'm ahead. I'm going to shoot that one over to Nuance Pro first. Go for it. Okay. He's passing it. Yeah, yeah you had quite a nice Showcase last number night, two. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I think I looked it up. The FBI, in about two-thirds of the cases when it comes to these sort of terrorism plots, I believe it's about two-thirds where they're the ones actually, uh, you know, forming the plots themselves. And then, you know, in, in many cases, they'll have uh, people who, you know, they're, they're like depressed or suicidal. Uh, maybe they have, you know, bad job prospects. And maybe if something pops up in their life, like they have a job prospect somewhere, the FBI, in order to further along this plot, will take that away from them just to kind of back them into a corner to do this thing that they came up with them, themselves. You know, they'll put people in their lives, like love interests, who encourage them to do these types of terrorist attacks, something that they wouldn't even necessarily do in the first place had it not been for the FBI. Okay, so you're saying specifically, oh, so you're saying, Anyways, um, that is the, uh, never mind. The, is, it, is it ethical to do that, though? If you um, are trying to catch a jihadi or, or somebody that, that's specifically trying to plant and you want to plant a person in their love life, like, is that, is that ethical? I mean, it's a, it, it's a tough line to, to draw. Uh, you know, the FBI actually has, I think, like ethicists themselves that, that try to determine, uh, you know, whether this is, Right in the first, like it, it, it's really hard because if you have a profile of someone who tends to be a, uh, you know, a, a terrorist, and you know someone fits that profile, they're going and they're taking the first steps, looking up like ISIS videos, they're posting it on their timeline. Uh, you know, they're depressed, they don't have family members or something, and you know they look like the type of person who might do a type of mass shooting or a you know a terrorist bomb plot. Um, do you go and see if you can kind of push them to do that? It's, it's hard to say, but in many cases that I've seen the FBI do this, it seems pretty unethical. When can you define entrapment? One of the pieces in the Whitmer case was specifically that there were $4,000 um, that were needed to find explosives to blow up a bridge that was, it would, in theory, stop the uh, police response to the kidnapping. But the guy purchasing this had no money at all and then agreed to pay with, quote, an IOU, and then the FBI kind of delivers the weapons and say, we caught you. Is, is that entrapment? I mean, somebody who probably couldn't have gotten the money anyways. Like, where do you, where, what, what's okay to do? Well, I, I do think it's a, a complex ethical question, but you have to go back to what, what is their intent? And, and their stated goal is to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution, does persuading people, encouraging people, putting them in situations where psychologically they feel that choosing to commit a crime is their best option, does that do that? And I think that's where, you know, a lot of FBI agents have kind of lost the plot. And there's a culture within the agencies that encourages rightness and getting the bad guy, you know, like we always get our man and there's certain um, incentives that, that create this and, and encourage it without really referring back to why are we even doing this? If we know someone is a potential danger, does it make more sense to uh, push them into a corner where they commit, almost commit a crime or should we try to get them help if they're mentally you know, struggling, as you're saying, there's certain um, kind of uh, 
markers of people who might be more likely to commit a crime, do we want to put them in jail or do we want to get them help? And I think these are conversations we're not having and we're not really thinking also about the FBI, other agencies also, but specifically we talk about the FBI as if, as if it's this like nebulous, faceless, nameless institution. It's an organization of people. So like any organization, it has leaders, it has a culture, it has a stated purpose, and it has the evolution of that purpose over time influenced by various things. And if you think about any organization, the people who rise to the top, who are they? The most ambitious, the people are will who are willing to do whatever it takes, the people who will work twice as hard, do what they need to do to get the result. The result in the FBI is get your guy. So again, I think a lot of the, the culture with, within the agency is uh, messy and a little misinformed in terms of really understanding the stated purpose from an ethical standpoint. Um, and I do think a lot of these cases are, do involve entrapment. I mean, I, I'm not a lawyer. I've learned a lot about the law, but I do think in terms of putting people in situations and circumstances where they wouldn't normally choose X and then putting them in prison because they almost choose it, that doesn't sound right to me. I think that when we talk about entrapment, I think that we have to remember what could potentially be on the other side. I think that people look at entrapment as you give somebody an opportunity to commit a crime and then they commit a crime and now you've entrapped them. But it could just as easily be not the FBI on the other side of that transaction sometimes, you know? If I'm able to convince a guy like, hey, if I front you $4,000, will you blow a bridge up? Maybe it's not the FBI. Maybe next time it's Al Qaeda or the Taliban or ISIS or some other organization. I think that for something to qualify legally as entrapment, you have to really push a person so that they feel like either their life is in danger or that, like they're about to lose a whole bunch of like, you know, somebody's abducted a family member, you need to go and commit a crime to, to save them or something. I think the, things like this would rise to the level of entrapment. But if it's just like somebody's giving you the opportunity to commit a horrible crime and you're like, you know what, yeah, I think I will. I don't think that qualifies as entrapment. I think that whatever consequences befall that, I think you probably have earned them. Have you seen the, are you guys familiar with the illusionist Darren Brown? He, there, do, you, do you know, have you seen his special? There's one where he basically shows, people have signed waivers and things to participate, although they didn't know that they were going to be participating in this particular experiment, but basically, sorry to uh, ruin it, so spoiler alert, uh, pushes people through a series of decisions where they go against their typical morality and are put in a situation where they end up choosing to kill a person. And these are just normal, everyday people off the street, which to me just shows how uh, techniques of persuasion, which intelligence uh, communities teach can be used and so it does go back to the ethics of it the purpose of it I, I agree with what you're saying I mean if you're just giving someone the opportunity and they choose it however I do think there are situations where they're very much pressured especially you know um, with uh, after 9-11 where they were trying to infiltrate mosques and things like that to potentially get ahead of uh, terrorist acts if someone didn't become an FBI informant they would make their life miserable so there, there's a lot of ways that they put pressure um, that I, I think is not good. I mean, I think, I think it's an interesting conversation to have about like the pressures that are put on people. But I mean, these pressures exist throughout like every facet of our lives, you know? Like it's, it's rare that somebody just picks up a gun and goes and shoots somebody. There's probably a lifetime of difficulty, of bad influences, of bad friends, of lack of opportunity that pushes a person to a particular point to where they're willing to kill somebody. I mean, I guess if we wanted to reevaluate how we punish all crime in society, I'd be interested in having that conversation. But I don't think we should pretend that like the FBI presenting the opportunity for somebody to do a crime and then them committing the crime is somehow like unique to the FBI. There are opportunities all around us every day for all sorts of people to commit crime. If you happen to jump on it and it happens to be the FBI that's kind of like baiting you into it, I mean, that's just right now how our system works, I think, for, for holding people accountable for those decisions. But, but, but there's a big difference between, you know, life circumstances creating the environment by which you become the person who create, you know, commits that act, right? As opposed to the FBI artificially like creating this. Yeah, but situation. again, it's what is artificial, right? It's artificial well, it's, because it's this time it's the FBI. It's the government, you know, targeting you as a person saying, we're going to make you. Do this. Yeah, but it could be somebody else. You don't yeah, know but, that. Yeah, but, right? but you understand, like, 
if that's a, the nature of life, okay, that's the nature of life. Do you think for we Chris can, Hansen, do you think if somebody thinks they're chatting with a 13-year-old online and then they meet and it's Chris Hansen, do you think that person should be absolved of all responsibility because it wasn't a real 13-year-old? No, or is it really it's, important it's because about, they thought it was a 13-year-old? No, no, but it's not, right? again, I'm not talking about you know, the opportunity. We're talking about you know, the entrapment aspect. Yeah, but so it, for, someone, for it to be entrapment legally, you have to push somebody really far. That's so what I'm just that, presenting yeah, them I'm not, the I'm not disputing that at sure. all. Like when I was talking, when, when I was making, you know, my statement, I was talking about, you know, introducing love interests from the FBI who encouraged them to do these types of things, taking away job opportunities. I think that's definitely a form of entrapment for sure. Sure, it can be. It depends on the specific case. Yeah. So there's a pretty fundamental difference here that's not being addressed, when, but it has been mentioned, as a matter of fact. But there's a pretty fundamental difference between, well, Al-Qaeda is out there, or whoever, it doesn't matter what the organization is, maybe it's the Trevor Project is out there, and they're trying to entrap people into whatever, and so we need FBI agents to make sure that, you know, that they're going to go pose as that, present similar opportunities, kind of look at the profiles, we're going to say, okay, blah, 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 this person might be willing to groom a child, or this person might be willing to engage in a kidnapping plot, and so let's, or, or to sign up with a terrorist organization or whatever. So let's poke at them, poke at them, poke at them to prevent that from being able to happen. But that's like minority report level, like pre-crime assessments for, for something. So we're talking, Al-Qaeda is not bound by the fucking United States Constitution, but the FBI in its own mission statement is. And the United States Constitution is absolutely clear that we absolutely cannot do unwarranted searches and seizures of, of, of people. And maybe that includes psychological searches and seizures. Uh, that's maybe a debate worth having about what this is. So when we talk about entrapment and what the legal legalities of it are, we also have to realize that what we're actually talking about is a meta conversation above that level. What the legalities are isn't really what we're discussing. Clearly, the FBI thinks it's behaving within the law. Of course, people like Ed Snowden have showed that many of these three-letter agencies were not operating within the, the confines of the law, but they will pretend at least that they're within the law. And so what we're actually discussing is, what should the law say for these people? So the, the definition of entrapment, as far as the law is concerned, when we see things like this entrapment plot have to come up, because certainly many constitutionally minded Americans are alarmed at what they're seeing. They think that this, I mean, we're having this discussion on the, on, is it, you know, there's differences in opinion. Does this constitute entrapment or not? So it's totally possible that the FBI is completely outside of its purview of what the U.S. Constitution says. The U.S. Constitution exists, or sorry, the FBI exists to, as a law enforcement agency, to protect, serve and protect American citizens, not to set them up to prevent them from possibly in the future engaging with some organization that might be a problem. There's a huge line of difference between, between investigating somebody, surveilling them, and then doing the meme where you've got the stick and you're like, go do a terrorism. The, the totally different, different domains. And the FBI, as a law enforcement agency in the United States set up to serve and protect U.S. citizens, in its own mission statement says that it's bound by the Constitution. And so we have to be looking at the constitutionality of these kinds of activities and talking about what the law should be in reflection of that. Um, certainly there is the point, you know, like you raised. That, yeah, these people might be about to do a terrorism or about to do a pedophile or about to do a whatever it happens to be. And you would hope in some sense that those people get caught before they're able to do it. But that's a really murky area when we're trying to protect individual rights. Uh, and, it, you know, Minority Report's obviously fiction, sort of. But, and we'll talk about that with a great reset later, I suppose, but we really, you know, we cannot be a constitutional republic of free people if we're going to start charging people or pursuing people for pre-crime that they haven't even committed yet. And then even to try to create the circumstances where they are going to, to take up a criminal action that maybe they hadn't even considered until that opportunity was kind of put in front of them and these, opportun uh, these, these situations were, were presented to them that, that they, were, they wouldn't have encountered necessarily otherwise. And so this is a real deep question um, and in my opinion, you know, the FBI is completely out of order in this, which probably puts me on some kind of list, which is the FBI can be well, completely out of order yet again. I mean, I, there's two, there's fundamentally two different parts of that. So if we want to address the constitutionality of it, I mean, law enforcement, local, state, and federal law enforcement have been involved in these types of operations for I, maybe over 100 years. I don't know how long they, how far back it goes. but. 
I mean, if it's unconstitutional, like, where are the cases, right? Has anything gone to the Supreme Court where the Supreme Court has said you're not allowed to engage in this type of investigatory behavior anymore? It doesn't seem like it. So I think that the constitutional question is, is, is a side argument. I, I guess maybe we can disagree with the judge's interpretation of the Constitution, but at that point, are you even being constitutional at that point? I think it gets a little bit strange. Aside from the constitutional argument, then you have, like, the general question of, can we give people an opportunity to commit a crime? And if they jump on that opportunity, should we punish them? I don't think, it, I don't think it's like pre-cog levels. I don't think we're at minority report. Um, I, I guess it's a separate conversation, but I mean, like, sh if, if you give somebody the opportunity to commit a crime, and then they jump on the opportunity to commit the crime, I just don't understand why you wouldn't think it would be appropriate to punish those people for attempting to commit the crimes. Um, again, like the most obvious example I can think of before is like, is all the Chris Hansen stuff bad because there wasn't actually a 13 or 14 year old on the other end? Or more reasonably, when we think of that stuff, do we think, well, actually it's okay because it could have been a 13 or 14 year old on the other end? I don't know if anyone's dis disputing that. Again, I think it's the aspect of entrapment, not the opportunity. And you well, know, that was—it sounded like the. I don't know. I mean, I, I can't. With, I even, can't with, the, with I, the FBI running those types of operations at all, like, should? Well, I'm curious. I guess for the panel, then, do, should law enforcement ever be in the business of providing opportunity for citizens to commit crimes for them to punish them for? I don't think that they should. Frankly, the creating the opportunity. Well, I, it's again. Are, it's a completely different thing. Like, let's say that you have, and so this, you bring up the 13, 14 year old. You have, you have FBI agents trolling around on the internet, you know, posing as 13 and 14 year old people, and, you know, looking to find pedophiles or whatever that are, they're going to solicit or try to groom or whatever. That, even in itself, is a very different thing than what happened in the case with, with Whitmer. Like, this was, there was literally, you know, more, there were more FBI agents involved than there were uh, people plotting uh, allegedly to do this. And then I, I was pulled out my phone specifically to Google what, because you said, where are the cases? If I'm not mistaken, but I may not be because I keep up with too many things at once, I don't know the specifics, but the case is just now, like literally, it just happened that the courts ruled that what the FBI did with the Whitmer plot, which is the specific context that we're speaking in, was absolutely out of line. And so I don't know what, how they ruled that. That's what I was going to double check, but I only got W-I-T-E so -E, uh, and I didn't get that far. Yeah, the, I believe like two of them were uh, acquitted. Um, th there was like a hung jury or something like that. But, um, you know, to his question, you know, you mentioned like the, you know, if FBI agents are on the internet, you know, trying to pose as like 13, 14 year olds to, you know, lure in these, uh, these potential predators, would you be okay with that, for example? Okay, so there's, in my opinion, there would be a complete difference between them being on the internet and saying, oh, I'm a 13-year-old girl, blah, 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 and if somebody comes, and they're just posing as a 13-year-old girl, and somebody comes to them and starts, you know, sexually soliciting them inappropriately or whatever, that's one category. Well, it's another thing entirely. If the FBI starts, like, literally direct messaging people and is like, hey, I'm a 13-year-old girl, you want some? And then the guy responds. I, I, I think or, these are two different cases. Or not saying 13, building a relationship, oh, yeah. then saying you're exactly. 13. Exactly. So and, there's a difference yeah. here between them providing the opportunity. If, this is a vague statement. The, the opportunity to commit a crime is provided by them posing as a 13-year-old online. I don't think that most people have any problem with this. If people then solicit that person or try to build a relationship or whatever it is, it's another matter altogether. If they start grooming somebody that they suspect who has not been convicted of any crime, who has not even been identified as a criminal in any way, it's another thing entirely. So I would be pers I'm personally happy to know that there are people that are doing sting operations where they create that, that character that pedophiles may be attracted to that then get stung where I'm perfectly unhappy with the idea that those people would then proact, the, the FBI agents or law enforcement agents would proactively target people they suspect might be pedophiles to see what they do when the opportunity lands in their laps. I don't think it's their position to be creating, it's one thing to be like a sting, it's another thing to be creating the circumstances by which you catch somebody who hasn't necessarily done anything wrong yet in the first place. Because civil liberties are really, really fragile. And this, I mean, this is the kind of thing that, that has to be protected. We talked, I mean, Nikki just talked a few minutes ago about the whole culture of get your man, get your man, get your man. I'm not saying like there's quota systems or anything like this, I'm not making that, that insinuation, but you can imagine that if that's the cultural mindset, like, oh, you know, Agent Smith, you're not supposed to call him Agent Smith, I guess, caught like 87 people, let's give him a promotion, then there's an incentive structure for Agent Smith to go do things that violate people's constitutional rights so that he can catch that extra third person or whatever that gets him his promotion. Or, and that is completely unethical. And, and there's no oversight. 
There, you, there's no, I mean, most, because I, I, I learned this uh, through my own personal experience, and then I started speaking to more and more people who have been affected. Most people will not sit somewhere. Most of these people who've been affected, who've been wrongfully convicted or railroaded or threatened by the FBI will not sit in a chair on a stage with a microphone and say these things because they are terrified. The FBI instills such fear in people that it's, it's very scary to speak up. And the reason I, speak, I sit here is because I think it's wrong. And everyone thinks it doesn't affect them until it does. And by then, it's too late. And uh, I think that we need to remember as citizens that they are public officials. They work for us. Their job is to protect us. And if we don't demand transparency and accountability and oversight, then, and we view them as kind of our overlords, that we need to make sure that we just don't say the wrong things and we don't step out of line. You know, we're not living in a free country, even though we might feel proud that we do. And, you know, I think that's something that needs to be discussed, addressed, encouraged. People need to take more responsibility in civic, civic discourse and, and look at what these agencies are doing. Like, it's great that we have example, not great. I mean, it's, it's great that we're talking about what happened with Whitmer and you know what happened on January 6th, but those things are not new or unique, I hate to tell you. You know, I think January 6th, um, which I hate calling it that, I don't know what, el what else to call it, but I feel like, What's the only other thing that comes to mind where we only use the date? 9-11. Right, so it gives it that kind of like gra gravity and I don't believe it should. But, um, sorry, did someone say something? Oh, I, I thought you wanted to add to the Could just call it an insurrection. Um, <laughs> insurrection, whatever, riot, protest, whatever you want to call it. You know, is that it affected a different demographic than it normally does and I think that is in part, I mean, aside from the polarization and the politics and obviously all of those things, I think that more people are waking up to the reality of what the FBI can and does get away with. I think, I, like, I think that your, your positions aren't without merit. I think there's a good conversation to be had about what tools or techniques should law enforcement utilize in order to catch criminals or potential criminals. I can't hold any of you three accountable for it. Maybe you. I don't know what you've tweeted recently. But um, I, I guess like the, the issue that I have is people feel, it, it feels like the political sides are very selective about who they get upset about when they overstep their boundaries. So I remember, for instance, uh, during a lot of the BLM stuff, you have uh, I think they would set up bait trucks sometimes in neighborhoods where you'd have like a truck, you'd put a ton of like boxes of shoes in it or whatever, and you'd get people running up, you'd see who steal from it, and then a cop would come out and bust the person. And I feel like at that time, the overwhelming opinion, a lot of people on the left were saying, well, this is unethical, they're in poor neighborhoods, of course people are going to try to grab stuff off a truck, it's not fair. And then I felt like conservatives at the time were very much pro, like, well, if you know, they could be breaking into your car. If they're going to steal from that truck, who's to say they won't steal from somebody else? Um, or same thing with like undercover cops that are trying to sell drugs to kids, right? Like if you try to buy from an undercover cop. I don't think I've ever heard a conservative say, well, this is unconstitutional. You shouldn't be doing that. You know, they tell you, well, you shouldn't be buying drugs. You're an idiot, you know? So I, I, think, I think there's some merit to the idea that maybe law enforcement shouldn't be trying to do these types of techniques at all. I, I think I would disagree with that, but I think there's merit to that argument. But I don't like how it's selectively applied by each side of the political aisle to only issues that they seem to care about. I mean, just because it kind of tied in with what I was saying, what you just said, I actually do think that these kinds of things should be happening. I even said I was glad that there were, were law enforcement looking for pedophiles, for example, on the internet. Uh, it's the question of, of how, right? It's the question of what are they doing to create the circumstances through which they then bust people. Uh, and that's not, a, that's not a left or a right position whatsoever. And that really does come back to the, the question that Nikki raised, which is that of accountability. It's one of my favorite linguistic little quirks of English is who polices the police? The police 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 police. That's who polices the police. And you know, you can just keep doing this and get infinite numbers of police in a single sentence. Um, right now, we have to invoke another another three-letter agency, the DOJ, we, have, we, we, we presume that the Department of Justice is going to be largely impartial and is going to come down and is going to investigate, say, if there's some kind of a breach uh, of ethical conduct or legal conduct by the FBI. But when you can't trust that that's going to occur, 
for example, more closely to the research and, and, and the work that I do, when you have the Department of Justice coming out when in an obvious conflict of interest scandal buried within it, declaring parents domestic terrorists for standing up against mask mandates and uh, critical race theory and the, the other uh, critical social justice theories being taught in schools and saying, well, this is, you know, obviously our parents are d domestic terrorists, we're going to investigate them as such and so on. You can't trust the Department of Justice. If the Department of Justice is that corrupt, and it's not about this specific point. How can you trust the Department of Justice is going to go over to their buddies in the FBI that do half the things that make the Department of Justice's job easier and say, you know, Agent Smith, you really screwed that one up right there, unless what happens is a gigantic public pressure campaign like this huge black eye they got on their, uh, for themselves by trying to do this Whitmer entrapment plot. Uh, so that's, for me, I mean, this is... Broadly speaking, can we trust three-letter agencies? I think a definitive answer to that question right now can be given that the answer is no if you think that there's some level of corruption where one of these agencies has no incentives or no political will to uh, hold accountable or have oversight over the other ones. There's no check or balance of power, and that's where, where people start to severely distrust these things. Of course, we're in a broader context where we're, we're talking about the FBI, but I brought up Snowden earlier, who, for, for the record, I was no fan of for a number of years until fairly recently when I realized the kind of the gravity of what he exposed. Um, these agencies are actually breaking the law, and nobody's holding them accountable. So we do have this oversight problem in a rather severe way where they're blatantly violating constitutional protections of American citizens, whether it comes down to these specific you know, entrapment type situations and what entrapment means or not, well, I guess we can debate these things, but for, I think it comes down to that. I am glad, however, that there are people that are trying to bust kids buying drugs or whatever as undercover cops, but if they're going to go show up at the school and be like, hey, kids, you want some pot? Come with me. You know, I'm not okay with that. Like, it's not your role, like, is to go try to trick kids into doing something that they might have done or might, might or might not have done anyway. Um, I have an issue with that. That's not for me, what I think law enforcement should be about. And you said it's not minority report, but that's only a matter of degree, because this slope, and I don't know how greased it is, I don't know how slick it is, but this slope ends at minority report. And this stuff that's like level one minority report is China right now. They, they are evaluating people for pre-crime in China. We see similar stuff happening even in, in Western nations like the UK where people are making statements online or in Canada where they make statements online and then they're getting investigated by three letter agencies in those countries because they might possibly do a terrorism or they might possibly have hurt somebody's feelings or something ridiculous uh, or you know, non-crime hate speech engagement, they call it. And then you have the police showing up. That was a British idea, uh, brilliant idea. And at this point, we are severely infringing upon, and, and granted, Britain doesn't have the United States Constitution, but I'm an American and I frankly don't care. And so we're severely infringing upon very basic rights that are written in our Constitution when law enforcement starts behaving in those ways. And uh, I mean, it comes back to, we do, I think we would all agree, and I'm sure everybody here would agree that we need some kind of mechanism for oversight because without such a thing, there is no trust. And if the topic of the panel is, can we trust them? The answer is absent that, no, absolutely not. And that should be a you know, five alarm emergency for every American if we're in a position where we can't trust our basic law enforcement agencies to say nothing of these other ones Brian named. Uh, so a couple things. Firstly, the DOJ did not say that parents were domestic terrorists. That was in response to specific complaints that some teachers were listening. I don't know if we're going to go into the weeds on that. But the DOJ didn't make a blanket statement about parents. That's the first thing. Number two, again, I can understand the, the merit of your argument that the police shouldn't be involved in something. But I think that it's, um, to add a bit of nuance to the conversation, um, I think that it can be difficult sometimes because what do you do when you have a guy that is starting to check off a lot of boxes of potential terrorists, but he hasn't done anything bad yet, but you can't pursue him because he hasn't. Um, I wish I could remember it off the top of my head, but I know there have been at least two cases over the past, like, I think over the past like seven or eight years, where you've had people that have gone and done like a mass shooting, either like at a school or at some public area, they've killed a few people, and then we later find out, well, this guy was on an FBI list. Well, in that case, now everybody's saying, well, the FBI, why'd you drop the ball? Why'd you mess up? Why didn't you do anything about that guy? And the FBI's like, well, he hadn't committed a crime yet. And like, well, that's not good enough. You need to be more preemptive about it. So but there's also confirmation bias in that, in, you know, like just because that one 
that there are many other people. Oh, so sure, there are a lot of people on this. Yeah, on everyone's rights just because that one. Well, we keep you know. using those words infringed on rights, which is, I think, a, it, it should be in the opinion of the Supreme Court if rights are being infringed upon, right? It's not necessarily for us to make that determination. And if the Supreme Court has upheld these types of investigatory tactics, then I, I, I think it's, I don't think we can say that it's unconstitutional without actually amending the Constitution, uh, unless we disagree with judicial review or something. Uh, I just, I think that it's, I think that there's, I'm empathetic towards some of the investigatory agencies where you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't, because you have these people that will check the boxes and maybe you catch some of them, maybe you stop some things, but then when you miss one guy who you were looking at and everybody's pointing the finger at you asking why you didn't do anything and well, the guy hadn't committed a crime yet, um, I think that's something that should be considered when we're talking about like trying to preempt some of the more disastrous things that could happen from people. I can empathize with that, but it doesn't make it right. Like, it doesn't mean that that is an excuse to then encourage agents or officers to go and put pressure on people to commit crimes. Which, well, I guess that's kind of what we're arguing about. Yeah, no, it about be, whether right, yeah. that is that or not. But I, I think that about it going to the Supreme Court or not, how, you know, if they've um, uh, violated constitutional rights, I think we don't, we don't see that because there's no oversight. Well, I mean, so the, the when over the FBI does things that are very, very shady, when you start talking to people and learning, you know, their their stories and their cases who won't speak publicly, and you understand how the FBI does that, you know, it doesn't get to that level because there's very narrow, if almost, it's impossible to bring it through the system that created it. So we need another. We need another. I mean, we have the, the the president is supposed to nominate heads to these branches, right? So technically, it, like they if you, are, they're politically. Yeah, if appointed, you have big disagreements yeah. with the branches, your your heads of these organizations are coming from the president of the United States. Um, I mean, if you really feel like something is messed up, you can get a committee in Congress to have a hearing. You can try to get one person to push a case through. Like it, it seems unlikely to me that there's all this illegality happening, and there just hasn't been a single person willing to test it in court yet. Um, I think that probably most of it. I'm sure there's some stuff that happens that probably shouldn't, but it seems like most of it is by the books. We just don't like how the books are written right now. What about transparency? Like, it, it seems just a bit weird that when, if you can sneak 12 people into the Whitmer plot, and the same guy with a, a Department of Justice and an FBI that's actually really focusing on domestic terrorism right now, when you fast forward to Jan 6th, I mean, the biggest question right now, it, Detective Ray, or Director Ray, responded to Amy Klobuchar, and she asked him, don't you wish that you maybe could have had somebody inside so we could have had some forewarning? Notice, notice she didn't ask the question, w did you get anyone inside? She said, did you wish? So he's able to kind of duck and dodge it. I, do you find it reasonable to believe that if you can sneak 12 people into a weird Michigan plot that there weren't people looking at these same agencies, the three percenters, the, the Proud Boys, um, the Oath Keepers, in, with foreign knowledge of the January 6th attack. I mean, I, I mean, transparency is always going to be hard with any enforcement mechanism, right? Like, that's, that's, that's going to be the case ubiquitously throughout all of time and human history and space. Like, the, the, people that are, the people that you've kind of entrusted with the sole authority to enact violence to enforce your laws or whatever, the, the tactics that they use, there's always going to be some difficulty in, in trying to look and see exactly what they're doing. But I mean, that's by design. I don't think any, well, I would hope that nobody would disagree with that completely, right? Like, you can't be completely open. You know, it's like, why don't, why don't we see exactly line by line what the Pentagon budget is? It's like, well, because then everybody could see line by line what the Pentagon budget is. Um, I, I understand the difficulties because you get into that who polices the police, the police, the police. But I mean, we have to use our institutions to hold them accountable as best we can. That's what we have our judicial system for. But the idea that there's going to be some massive transparency behind all of the enforcement mechanisms would just lead to people being able to avoid all the enforcement mechanisms, right? It, like when you pick up your phone to get transparency on where the, you know, the speeding trap is, you know, you slow down and then you speed up when you get by it. That would basically be how every crime would be committed in the entire United States if there was a 100% transparency from all of our law enforcement. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to transparency about, uh, you know, were there people on the inside for January 6th? And, you know, we've seen the testimony in Congress about how they refuse to answer that question. I think that has more so to do with it being an ongoing investigation than necessarily something nefarious. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's hard to get transparency during an ongoing investigation. Any thoughts? I'm just stuck on the idea that it's being kind of just assumed 
that we can trust these organizations at all, frankly. Um, like the idea that Stephen shared a moment ago uh, that, you know, uh, there may be some dirty dealing going on, but it's probably mostly pretty good. I, I'm actually stuck on that. I just cannot actually conceive that that's how a largely unaccountable agency that's set up to largely police itself or be policed by its buddies uh, is going to operate in the long term, especially when the incentives aren't necessarily there uh, if they can get away with it. In, in a sense, this transparency question, they have internal transparency, they, so they, they know. So they know exactly where those speed traps are. They know exactly where to speed up and slow down so they can get around the law where no one else can do that. And the, 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 the very idea after what we've seen come out in the past two to four years that, that any of these organizations are largely playing by the books I think is almost laughable, um, frighteningly like sad laughter I guess, but I, I'm still stuck on that idea. Now well, transparency I mean, becomes a remedy to this in part, but you are correct. You can't just you know publish everything that they're doing obviously because that's how most of these things operate is that you have to, to operate behind a, a veil. Uh, but the idea that there's any trustworthiness to this entire program is still just, like, I, I just broke when I was like, oh yeah, everything's probably okay. No, no, nothing is okay. Uh, nothing I mean, I is okay. I think we can trust them to serve their own motivations. Yes. And I think we need to be realistic about what those are. I what agree. are their goals? And how do they operate as individual human beings? Like, again, we, we, I think we often either consciously or, or unconsciously kind of depersonify the agencies. You know, FBI, they're an agent. What if you called them federal employee John Smith? Because that's what they are. You know, they're not this, like, spy cool, I, I don't know, there's like this kind of mystical, magical thing about them. And I think the transparency, yes, of course, you don't want to give away tactics that would aid in your effort to protect Americans, but they are supposed to be seeking truth and justice. To honor that within a court of law, you need evidence. You need to show, you need to show your work of how you are saying this person is a criminal. And part of that is showing how you got it. So I do think in an effort to uphold the Constitution, there is transparency required. Did you, did you guys know that when FBI agents interview someone, they don't record it? They take notes. Do you trust that they have perfect memory and ability to scribble in their notepad exactly what you said? I can make this so much worse. Like, people have no idea where we're headed. Do you realize that the device that I pull out of my pocket can record literally every sound that you make, every keystroke you've ever typed on it, whether you deleted it or not, and that there are data silos under the mountains in, st in states like Utah and Nevada and Colorado storing terabytes upon petabytes upon petabytes of data of people's conversations, of people's uh, text that they've typed, every website they visited, if you have one of those apps that tracks your heart rate, what that was while you were doing it. Um, my friends actually, she texted me and thought it was hilarious at the beginning of the year that it tracked that her number two loss of sleep was masturbating. So her watch that she was wearing knew that she was diddling herself. And it also knew her buying behavior and her internet behavior within an hour on either side of that activity. Okay, so that's one aspect of where this is going, but this is, this is the big one. Do you trust them to take notes faithfully? Do you trust that they haven't implanted something from, that they allege that you typed into your phone in 2015 on some device you don't even have, that you deleted and didn't send to anybody, and then when the evidence comes to court, because you're a political dissident, you disagree with what the regime's doing today, they pull you up in front of the Department of Justice, they hold you, hold you in a trial, and they say, well, what evidence do you have? And they trot out a digital ID that they implanted into that data silo that you never actually did. And what are you gonna do? I don't remember typing that. Well, here's the, the, the digital record of that, sir. This is the direction that this can go, and this is why this is such an incredibly important topic for us to be talking and thinking about right now, because we are right now about a year, year and a half away from the technology with AI to be able to start data mining those gigantic silos of data, 
and be able to decide through kind of minor, minority report style pre-crime analyses of people who might be a dissident, who might be a problem, who might be a potential terrorist, who might just be an agitator to the state, who, like a lot of the people who just happened to show up at January 6th or whatever and ended up uh, in prison for this. Who are these people? And then if they want to put you away and lock you away without due process or whatever else, they can do so on potentially fabricated digital digital uh, signatures of things you typed or said or websites you might have visited. Oh yeah, you went to a bunch of child porn sites back in 2015 or 16, you don't even remember it, but here's the digital record that they could implant. And I'm telling you, when you start talking about the potential for violating people's constitutional rights, it's all well and good. This is why I broke when it was like, oh, I think everything's probably going by the books. How are we to know? The question on the panel is, how do we know if we can trust these agencies? When this technology is literally around the corner, and we see it being employed in countries like China, so we know that people who have the power, who have sufficient amounts of corruption, uh, will employ this technology to their own advantage. How do we know that, that our other three-letter agencies or whatever else, appointed by the same president or the same actually pers uh, presidential personnel office, not the president, uh, in virtually every administration. How do we know that those people don't have some broader political agenda that's going to shut down, maybe, maybe it's deplorables this year, maybe it's libtards next year, uh, or whoever, ha maybe, you know, President Dictator Trump or whoever gets in office and decides he's going to shut down every, every progressive that's ever spoken up and they use the DOJ to implant this digital evidence. I'm telling you, this is where this is going. And we know it's going there not because, oh, it's possible, so let's speculate in a Black Mirror episode. It's literally what they're doing in China. And so the people who want to build our digital architecture with a social credit score and a digital ID, et cetera, like China, are going to be able to employ tools like they witness in China if it's a threat to their their um, their power. Do you see Edward Snowden on American soil? No, no, he's still hiding out, and there's a reason why. And all he did was expose what they were doing. Not to say that it was legal, but what he did was expose what they were doing, and they really didn't want that exposed. So this could, I mean, this can multiply very quickly and lead to a totalitarian state unlike anything we've ever seen before. So when we start talking about trust and transparency, this is like some next level important conversation where eh, I bet they're probably not messing up because presidential appointees is just not gonna cut it. Okay, so. I, okay, I, that, impressive. I, so Destiny, are we gonna power level up to, uh, you know, if, if this, are we gonna power level up to to that kind of security stuff. Okay, I agree that the conversations are important, but the reason why we can never have good conversations in society is because both sides want to hijack it into the most insane, like, conspiracy territory so that we don't even get to talk about what is actually happening today. So, like, for, like, the idea that simultaneously these organizations have somehow, behind the backs of every corporation, gotten into these like semiconductor fabrication plants and, and installed secret microchips that I guess Intel, AMD, nobody knows about, but then come out and they cry publicly, Apple, please unlock the phone for our investigation, we can't get in, it's just, it's insane. How can both of these things be true at the same time? There are corporations with vested interests in security in their technology to make the public understand that like there isn't a secret backdoor. No, 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 no. There is no way, hold on, wait, you just, wait, 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 you just like no, no, no it, it, I agree that it's important. Hang on Hold just on. a second, James. I'll, I'll give you a chance one right back. You, you do re listen, one point. There's a severe difference, and you can address it, between privacy and security. They do give you security. They don't give you privacy. All right, continue. Well, I, privacy and security can go hand in hand. I mean, they it depends don't. on... It, they, Usually they do. Uh, generally, when somebody feels like their information is private, it's because they want to keep it secure, and that private information, like a password, might be related to your security. It might be the biometrics you use to sign into your phone. It might be something you type in a, in a private message or whatever, but usually privacy and security go hand in hand. That's why if you open your Twitter or any social media account, it's usually under the exact same tab. Um, I think that it's important to have conversations about techniques that people use when they do these investigations, but I mean, like, if you want to know if your phone is tracking you, if you want to know if it's sending data off, like, you can download programs, you can look at the telemetry of any device you use and find out where data is being shipped off to. Like the information, you can't hide it on your router. If you really want to see where the data is being sent to. If you think that other corporations are, are, are sending it off to people, why do so many corporations fight with these agencies when they try to pull information out of them? I think Facebook has fought with people over it. Apple has fought over giving, um, over, over giving like passwords or backdoor encryptions into phones to the FBI. Uh, the idea that these organizations are simultaneously fighting and cooperating at the same time just doesn't make any sense. I, we also keep using this word, illegal, unconstitutional. 
I think that what we mean to say is I don't like it. When you say something is illegal, you mean I don't like this thing. And when you say something is unconstitutional, you mean I don't like this thing. Because again, if they're employing all of these illegal tactics, where are they in the courts? It's why haven't these been challenged anywhere? No, like, no, why no, are it's people taking worse. them up through? So it's this, this, much idea, worse than that, this idea, this idea that all of these agencies are fundamentally corrupt and fundamentally untrustworthy, and we can't trust any of them. But we can trust like Alex Jones and Tim Pool and Dave Rubin and these people that are getting paid so much money to sell you these narratives, right? We don't look at the conflict of interest there. We only look at this amorphous blob, which you rightfully pointed out. I'm glad you did. These organizations are full of tons of human beings. You're telling me that there is this top-down plot and the FBI where there is a culture created where they're using all these illegal and illicit tactics and nobody's leaked anything. But I was able to read text messages from the select group of investigators that Mueller was using. They're like we had a whole court thing over this where they were talking about leaked text between. Um, I don't remember the. the um, Peter, I don't remember the Peter guy's Strzok. name. Are we talking about Tucker Carlson's emails? Strzok. Whoops, no, that's Strzok. something else. Yeah, Strzok or whatever, right? We're getting text, personal text messages, private text messages between two of these people. One, I don't even think it was an agent, but I think they might have both been agents. But the idea that we have like this level of transparency in some parts, and then in another part, it's all the same amorphous blob. I think that we can just ditch all of the conspiracy nonsense and let's bring it back to reality and let's have a conversation about what should the techniques be that these agencies are allowed to use. Let's not pretend that they somehow have private technology that's like outdoing the, the, the public sector child. by decades or whatever, I, any of these like crazy things, because it's, 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 it's lunacy. You, don't, you we think don't get I got anywhere. this from Tim Pool? Are you drunk? <laughs> but wait, 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 wait. I, Holy the thing is, I don't, shit. I, don't think, I don't think we need to get to that extreme to expose what they're doing and talk about the tactics because the reality is 2% of um, indictments convict, um, go to trial, right? Most of them are plea deals. During that process, you, you know, FBI agents can lie to you. Um, they can say whatever they want to get you to talk. If you lie, it's perjury. That's a federal offense. So they can say a whole bunch of things. They can say they have what you're talking about, and that if, if you go to trial, you are going to be perceived as a predator because you meet these other criteria. No jury is going to take you seriously or have any sympathy for you. You're not wait, going what is to that? be credible. Wait, what do you mean? This is secret. What, am I, what do I mean? What do you mean? Like, like you can't that, just, you can't take somebody to trial and just say like, this guy's a predator. Like you have to present some sort of evidence to substantiate that, right? Yep. Well, you can indict them off of very flimsy evidence. You a can indict them off of testimony. You can, sorry? A confession's good evidence. You know, we're going to go well, to trial. We have X, Y, Z. Why don't you just admit it to us or you're going to look really bad and we'll make a deal with you. I mean, this is why, don't, isn't there a thing when a cop arrests you, don't they say, where was this, what was this guy's name? Marama? Miranda? Miranda. Miranda, Miranda right. Miranda, right? Yeah, <laughs> we have these things read off to us when you're arrested. I mean, I agree, it's really dumb that people talk to the cops about getting a lawyer, but what, I mean, what more are you going to do, right? You read them your rights when you arrest no, them. No, but you, he's saying someone else. No, like, someone else can say you did something. You know they interview people before arrest, right? And they don't have to read Miranda rights before arrest. They do that all I the don't, time. I'm not sure you know if that, that if Miranda it's a rights are a ritual. <laughs> Like, that doesn't stop an FBI agent from sitting down and lying to you in a questioning room where there's no recording, there's no defense, and you can't even reply in lying kind. And they say, we have X, Y, Z on you. You don't have the slightest maybe idea. Let's say you're totally innocent. You have the slightest idea how they got it. You don't know what it is. And they say, well, look, we have the evidence. We're going to take you to court. We're going to try you on it. The easiest path out of this for you is to cut a deal with us right now of some kind, plead guilty, write a confession, et cetera. Now they have hard evidence, and when it goes to court, they've manufactured the evidence. This is totally possible. This has happened. It happens all the time. I so, don't think it happens all the time. that they. I think that there are a few huge cases where it happens, and we hear about it when they've totally fabricated something out of thin air. But I mean, again, like all you can tell people are you have rights afforded to you. Now we're actually talking about rights, not the we think it's illegal, we think it's unconstitutional. You actually have rights rights afforded to you as an American that if you don't want to talk to an officer, right, am I being detained? Am I free to go? Am I under arrest? Okay, well, I want a lawyer. I'm not talking to you until I get one. In the United States, you're afforded that right. Tell people about it. Not enough people know and about it. you're if you afforded watch the a right to a speedy trial, which if everyone did, the courts would collapse. Like these are, I agree, these are the things, pe more people need to know their rights. But the problem is, as I said before, most people think it doesn't affect them. You live a reasonably, you know, sure, you, that's not you the pay your taxes. People's you, problems, right? Tell people. 
I am. Know? That's why I'm here. Okay, that's, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, but don't, like, but no, no, no. So what I'm selling the message Steven. that these systems are fundamentally corrupt and unworkable. A lot of times, people just don't know how to work the system, right? So people, a lot of people will I, like. I've watched. So I'm sure you guys are all familiar with like the JCS YouTube videos, where you will get people, you will get investigators that build entire cases in the interrogation room because for some reason they just decide to talk and talk and talk and talk. And I mean, it's I guess it's good when they find the bad guy or whatever. But yeah, I mean, more people should be aware of what their rights are. And and a lot of that's more before Miranda warnings, by the way. In, it's, they, they get a lot of those before. Miranda if warnings. you've been if you've been arrested yeah but a lot of these are before they're arrested they just bring them in they're like oh we want to learn about what happened to so and so or whatever I don't and, know you if know, you they, can they submit, have a I don't hunch know if that you can... this person did it but they don't have probable cause for arrest and they try to determine that in the interview process I wish I the answer this because I don't know it offhand no, they, they but do. I don't there I don't know if actually... you can submit that evidence in court yes, if it was you absolutely if it was can. obtained you before absolutely your Miranda can. that's why you have those JCS videos in the first place no those were people were arrested not always it's not always I guess well when they definitely did it with with Flynn Right. The, the, the whole point was to see if he would admit to something under investigation. No, the, the FBI, uh, there's, um, who was it, uh, the Attorney General Mukasey in 2008, at the end of the Bush administration, uh, introduced these guidelines that allows the FBI to do what are called assessments. And you need zero probable cause to go and um, follow someone, so, so physically surveil them, send in informants to talk to them and elicit, you know, information and uh, access public, you know, information and, and uh, potentially, I think, like, commercial information. So it's, it's shady. I mean, it's obviously, not, it's, it's not shady? all it's not bad shady. intended, it, 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 and it, it can be is. used for good. As, as, so, so I've, had three, I've, had three, I've had three interviews with the FBI because I get people saying crazy stuff about me online. So they come and they talk to me. When the FBI shows up, they knock. They say, hey, we're agents from the local branch. And I say, okay, I'll answer a couple questions, but otherwise I'm not saying anything. If you want to charge me with something, you can. Most of the time they can. But like a, a lot of policing, I don't know if we have police officers in here. A lot of policing happens before like any like criminal official process is started. You know, whether it's walking up to somebody on the street and asking them like, hey, what are you doing here? What's going on? Or whether it's an FBI agent like looking into something through some publicly available information. The idea that you would like completely defang all of your investigatory agencies and say that like, if you don't have a warrant, you can't even look at a person. I, I mean, that is a route that we can go but I don't think that people would generally be happy with the outcomes of that route if we started to, if a lot of stuff started basically slip through because you need like a concrete, you know, 100%, we can only talk to this guy when we literally have the warrant signed by the judge to indict him with a crime and arrest him. I don't think people would be happy with the outcome of what society would look like if that was the case. Uh, Again, I think it's, it's a tool and, and it can be used for good and it can be used for not good. And so we need to look at what, who are the people wielding this tool how are they trained? What's the accountability? Is there transparency? Are there consequences if they abuse the tool? And I think that's our biggest issue right now is, is there aren't. I wanted to see if we could bring this back to what James was talking about, which is trust and uh, you, you know, be, being able to trust these agencies. I, I don't think, you know, for example, the ATF, I think, is a good example. They don't do themselves a lot of favors when, you know, they're responsible for, you know, in interpreting laws that Congress has passed, and they're supposed to form, you know, basically the interpretation of these laws, uh, like, like when it comes to the bump stock issue. You know, they, they issued, I think, something like 10 private letters establishing the legality of these bump stocks, and then because some mass shootings happen and Trump was like, oh, we're going to do something about these bump stocks, all of a sudden they outlaw it even though there's been no change in existing law, which is not something they're really actually allowed to do. They, they, they changed, they, 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 the definition is very clear on what a machine gun is, but then they just decided to go in there because Trump's like, well, we should outlaw these, and they did it just by saying, okay, they're machine guns now. Well, I mean, the ATF is an organization that exists under the purview of the president. The president can give direction to these agencies. Bump stocks aren't constitutionally protected things. Like, that's, but, part, that's yeah. part of the executive privilege of, of how any of these, the EPA or anything, operates. We don't pass a new law every time a new type of thing happens within these. It just wouldn't work. Congress would but shut no, down. But, but it's specific in law what counts as a machine gun, so you can't outlaw something and call it a machine gun. For example, like, what if the ATF t tomorrow decided to call every handgun a machine gun because the ATF says so. They're or not allowed. That to do that. That's not legal. 
or one that doesn't have a, what is it, the smart guns they want to move to that, that you can actually disable from a remote distance and you have to have the right fingerprint to fire it. You know, that's how they're going to get around. What if they Amendment. said the only gun you're allowed to have is that, that no, yeah. that would require legislation. If it's illegal, where are the legal challenges? But, so we're kind of cutting into it. This is, well, this well, is well, their yeah, issue. It's actually uh, pending before right, the Supreme Court. So for a second, right, just right, right, real quick, right, right, we do have Q&A coming up, which probably has to go machine gun style, so we'll go ahead and line up if you have a question while we still debate what a machine gun is here. Yeah, but this isn't this this isn't about the ATF. Okay, so this is about the general question of trust, like my nuance bro said here, and that is that if you have these administrative agencies that can just start doing this policy, we bring up the ATF and bump stocks. But holy shit, look at the CDC. Oh, you can wear masks this week. You have to wear them then. You know, you don't have to wear them. Like nobody can trust this stuff, and this is the science. And we have to when you have policy that can just change in the wind with administrative, you know, decree. We have got a long way away from the way our republic was established, and that's an issue that regardless of legality, regardless of, oh, that's how we've spent the last hundred years screwing up our republic, or whatever argument you want to make, oh, of course I trust these people, or no, I don't trust these people. When you have this ability, as we just witnessed through the pandemic, especially with the FDA, CDC, et cetera, outlawing all of a sudden Apple pectin, which you're not allowed to talk about because you get your Twitter account taken away from you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Outlawing uh, uh, N-acetylcysteine for F's sake, uh, because you know maybe it helps denature spike proteins and reduce inflammation. If you have a so James just wants what I'm we, saying is you lose all of your trust in these agencies if they can just start doing this crap. And so this is one of the main reasons why I don't trust these agencies. I can't trust these agencies if they can declare a pandemic. We all have to stay home. But now there's a racial justice issue, so you don't have to stay home if that's the reason you're not staying home. Like you can't trust agencies that operate this way fundamentally. Okay. Now, let's see if our first uh, questioner at Trust the Agencies. Go, go ahead. So I'd say this is one of the more frustrating talks to listen to, mostly because so much of it is about legal issues that you all admittedly say, like, I'm not sure about this, but so in the future, actually having lawyers would be really helpful. Uh, but going back, like, yeah, why don't you? Out. Where's the lawyers at for this conversation? I'm, I'm just a law school dropout, so I can't help, sorry. Uh, but my question would be to zoom back and ask, like, can I trust the Department of the Interior or Housing and Urban Development? Like, can I trust not just the agencies that get in the news, but the ones that nobody pays attention to? Are those trustworthy? I mean, these are all inherently political positions. I, a lot of times, they're really depends just on who's in power there. That's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a, it, that's just the nature of, of government. Um, you know, sometimes housing and urban development can be, you know, fairly neutral, and sometimes they can be, like, super partisan and have these, like, radical agendas, and they want to, you know, do crazy things. And, I mean, you, I don't know. I, I don't really think you can... It's, it's, a, it's degrees of trust. There's never, like, oh, you can absolutely trust them or, no, you can't trust at all. I think it varies. I think, you know, some agencies are a lot more credible than others. I'd say, you know, you can't really trust the CIA all that much. I mean, they literally spied on the Senate, lied to them about it, and then what happened from it? Nothing, right? And then there's, you know, there's other ones that have better, I mean, CBO is like, I don't know, does, does people have big beefs with the CBO. I mean, sometimes people don't like their numbers, but, you know. All right. And uh, anyone that's on stream or uh, in the audience, DM us if you're a lawyer. <laughs> We'll put you on the list. So my question is, I think most people would recognize innocent until proven guilty as like a foundational concept in our justice system here. Uh, aren't the techniques we're talking about kind of a fundamental, fundamentally different thing? Because uh, to me, what's implied in innocent until proven guilty is that we would rather not imprison an innocent person and let someone guilty go free, right? That's like where we line up on that. But the techniques we're talking about are kind of guaranteed to probably catch up some innocent people. And we're saying that we'd rather get that terrorist or whatever, even if it costs a few innocent people. So what are your thoughts on that? Innocent until proven guilty is something that the courts are supposed to uphold. Like, I don't think we look to law enforcement to just assume the innocence of every person. Otherwise, law enforcement wouldn't do anything, right? Um, I, I mean, the goal ultimately should be that the courts, through the process of submitting evidence before a judge and all of that, are making sure that the techniques that the 
uh, investigatory agencies, whether we're talking local law enforcement or FBI, are, are constitutionally valid. And you just made me think of uh, one of the most prevalent and effective techniques employed uh, by law enforcement to ensure someone's guilt in the courts is the media, is using the media. You indict in the media, and there is no innocent until proven guilty in our current kind of polarized culture. Um, it's very effective. Wait, wait, As what the is it in a criminal, uh, wait, for criminal charges, the, what does that mean? Like uh, an agent might do, or the DOJ will do a press release and say all these awful, awful things that have not been proven. They, need, they don't need to pr present evidence. They create a media storm. They have relationships with you know, wonderful papers like the New York Times and things like that. No, no, what, okay, so here, so this is, it's the simultaneous, it's again like the, they're very powerful, but somehow completely incompetent. Weren't like, what, wasn't it like five or 600 people arrested over the January 6th stuff? Haven't they thrown out like three or 400 of those indictments? Shouldn't all of these people have been arrested and then charged if they had so much power to influence the media and then influence the courts and then influence the judges to get them fabricated evidence well, and then thrown in jail? I, I don't like, think she's talking about the whole legal process, but there is this relationship where like, for example, when Roger Stone was arrested, they, they, they got a tip from the people, you know, I think the FBI who was arresting him, you know, this, the media got a tip and they were able to film that. And it was like this whole production of like a SWAT team going in and everything. I mean, there's absolutely this relationship and they're trying to paint a picture of, you know, this person bad. And it's not even to necessarily get a conviction. Sometimes the, the process is the punishment in itself. You know, you can ruin someone's life. Sure. Yeah, but once they've committed to their thesis in the public, they're much more incentivized to be right than to seek truth and justice. This is true, and it is an issue, but then you have, but then on the other end, like, I think in the United Kingdom sometimes they're quick to gag certain cases so that you can't have public discussions because they agree that they don't want that influencing the trial. But then on the other end, you'll have hardcore constitutional people that will say things like, well, hold on, you have a right to a public trial. We don't want, because I feel like if it was the opposite way, where, you know, we don't have any of these people, you know, like uh, filming, you know, Roger Stone getting arrested or whatever, now we'd be up here saying like, well, I think it's crazy that they're arresting people and we don't get any information about the court. We don't know anything about what's going on. But we can't filming talk a about trial it, like. is very different than f filming someone's perp walk and, and public humiliation before they've even had a chance to go to trial. Yeah, federal trials are not recorded. State trials. Wait, hold on. You're yeah. saying criminal... Federal... Like, cri Uh, I don't know about federal criminal, but most, most um, criminal charges are state charges anyways. When we talk about like rape and murder or whatever, these are... Sure, I, yeah, I don't know about federal. We're talking about things like murder cases or rape cases. Supreme right? Court's think. never televised, by the way. I just brought up the media is a very effective tool. It, it doesn't apply in all cases, but it, it, it definitely is... Yeah, I, I'm uh, just asking, like, what is the alternative? Like, are we not allowed to talk about ongoing cases? Maybe film the federal yeah, trials. I think filming federal trials is essential. Uh, many other, many other ideas, but I think that that people, like people, the citizens don't have a responsibility the same way the courts do, as you're saying, to uphold innocent until proven guilty. There need to be some some thoughtfulness around how the media handles someone yeah. who's who's charged before they're allowed their day in court. Yeah, so I agree. We got to do another one though. Yeah. We're, we're kind of running out of oh, time. Yeah, yeah, Go yeah, ahead. Yeah. I will also ask if you have a question to Sorry, stand up and get in line to ask a question and not uh, yell from the stands. Thank you. Uh, I just noticed that Destiny's breaking the no outside drink rule. I'm doing the what? You're breaking the no outside drink rule. It's past three. No outside. No outside drink. <laughs> Is that a rule for the I guess that's uh, a rule for the theater, yeah. Yeah. It was Sorry. announced, but we were backstage. Um, so the question I was going to ask is, how do you properly regulate the FBI and try and uh, get information on how they're gathering in their own information? It's not like it's easy to sue them. FOIA requests don't work. Yeah, get real close to the mic. You kind of got like. How do we? I think the question is, you don't have you to make out with it, but you do have to. How do you close. properly audit Sorry, the that. FBI? Is a question. Well, there needs to be a group that is not the FBI and is not beholden to FBI, is not, does not answer to a political um, force that investigates these things. I mean, I think it We could just abolish it. Yeah, I, I, so just get rid of it. Yeah, it, it's hard if to it's say, lawless, but I mean, get rid of it. 
Yeah, it, it's hard to say, but we already have processes in place with like inspector generals. Like you know, have you know, that, that's what happened. I mean, that's what happened with when the CIA sp uh, spied on the Senate. We learned you know about the details of it through an inspector general's report. So um, you know, even with uh, the Russia Gate stuff, they you know, there was another you know independent inspector uh, general. So I think inspector generals are a decent way to go about it. Okay. This question this question is for Nuance Pro. Do you think it's moral for a three-letter agency to overthrow a democratic government to establish a authoritarian oppressive monarchy? <laughs> is that, Wait, the, the DOJ is going to be a monarchy? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Nuance Pro supports the Shaw. Um, so my question is, you guys talked a lot about uh, entrapment. But like entrapment is the government tricking you into committing a crime for the sole purpose of securing a prosecution. Obviously, we're not in favor of that because you're bringing a random criminal into into a situation they wouldn't be in. My question is: is where is uh, do you guys support actually investigating and finding these plots? Because you're talking about all these edge cases where the FBI goes out, finds somebody who's already working on a plan and interceding. Or is it like the number of agents in key positions that bothers you? Because it seems like you were talking about how many people were FBI rather than what stage of the plot it was at before the FBI got involved. Yeah, I mean, again, when I when I was talking, you know, about this, I always talked about the entrapment aspects, which I'm not a fan of. But I actually don't have a problem with the FBI doing these sort of like, you know, fishing expeditions. I don't have a problem with police doing it. Like, I don't have a problem with bait cars. I don't have a problem with, uh, you know, outside of just disagreeing with aspects of the drug war. I don't have problems with like the specific tactic of, you know, being the, you know, the, the drug dealer or whatever and catching the person doing it, et cetera. Uh, you know, same for, you know, bigger scale type federal investigations. A fellow precog. <laughs> Good. Right. Open question for the whole panel. How can we trust these agencies when they meddle in our national political decisions when they label the Hunter Biden laptop scandal as Russian misinformation? So, if I'm not mistaken, most of those were like former heads who were talking about that at the time. So they were always saying, oh, former heads of, you know, this and that. And like, at that point, they're all political actors anyway. I mean, they're probably political actors to begin with. And again, I don't really agree that we can fully trust uh, any of these agencies. But uh, in that particular case, it was, I think, mostly former heads uh, talking about how, and they didn't say it was Russian disinformation, they said it had all the hallmarks of it. Uh, but yeah, it was, I mean, that was stupid. I have a simpler answer. We can't. And it's a problem. Okay. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so if the FBI and the CIA and the government in general is so corrupt, how comes people like Kyle Rittenhouse and Trump, how comes they haven't been put in jail, and how is Kyle Rittenhouse being able to get off? Well, I don't know how many uh, DOD employees that were appointed by Trump you're aware of that are being kind of politically persecuted and having their houses searched and their assets seized occasionally. Uh, I don't know if you're following what's happened with uh, Project Veritas, for example, in similar uh, regard, but... Um, to say that these agencies are corrupt is not to say that every single judge is corrupt. It's not to say that every single jurisdiction is corrupt. Um, it's not to say that the, every single detail within the broader corrupt program is a problem. It's to say that the agency itself is behaving in ways that are, that are completely unacceptable, uh, possibly illegal. It's not just, I don't like it, possibly illegal, possibly unconstitutional. And that what we, what we actually do need is we need to rely upon judges who will adjudicate on these things and hash these things out. And we should be thankful, frankly, that there are some judges who have not uh, gone completely over to a political agenda. And it's ultimately adopting a political agenda that um, corrupts these things. It's, we, we even just talked about it. What do you, you, know, what do you, what do, you do when, when you start to believe that the CDC has adopted a political agenda? What do you do when you see former heads of the FBI clearly acting as political actors rather than, and, and of course you just see FBI when you're an average dude watching television and you say, oh, FBI head guy, okay, that's all you remember. You don't, a former, who cares? No one pays attention. What that does is it erodes trust. But to say that these ent entities have corruption 
and even a significant scale isn't to say that literally every person involved in the entire system is corrupt. You know, corruption, it's like rust, right? Everybody knows I have swords. Everybody knows that if you have carbon steel, you have to treat it. Rust, it's like it starts in one little spot and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It's not like the, you, your sword is shiny one day and the next day it's this like red crusty thing. Um, James, did you bring your swords? No, they don't travel well. <laughs> All right, go, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, I can't hear uh, about this issue or like the Whitmer incident without thinking about uh, Afeni Shakur, who fought the FBI on charges of attacks on police stations where the FBI agents had infiltrated the Black Panthers and uh, not only coerced, but also took part in planning those attacks. When she brought those concerns of their infiltration to her partner, um, he said, man, they couldn't be cops. You, you should have seen the shit that they did. She successfully fought these charges without a lawyer, um, meaning it was a pretty airtight case. Uh, I've seen evidence that agents involved in the Whitmer incident were involved in a planning capacity. Uh, that doesn't sound like a honeypot to me. That sounds more like entrapment. So I, I feel like the question here is how can we call for anything other than more intense scrutiny on these agencies and other than transparency? I don't see how you can defend these uh, these actions on any level. And if there are multiple incidents of this in the past, which there are, Afeni Shakur is one of many, how do we trust them at all, period? I, the, I the, don't. The question yeah. of trusting agencies is a stupid question. In, in the United States. It's the topic, it's, though. In the, <laughs> but I mean, you don't want Thank to. You. It, so it matters. In the trust United, matters. Hold on. In the United States of America, we don't inherently trust any institution. This is why our entire. Why defend them then? This is. Okay. I hate this guy, okay? <laughs> the feeling's mutual. I'm... <sighs> In the United States of America, we have so many checks and balances set up because we inherently do not trust these institutions. The question should never be, do we trust an institution to, to, to what? To operate uh, without oversight? To operate without any sort of check and balance? The question should be, what do we need to implement to ensure that we feel like the organization is properly being checked by other types of organizations in our government? Um, I'm glad that we've changed now to saying possibly illegal and possibly unconstitutional because we do have these auditing processes in government to, to, to check, whether we're talking about inspector generals, whether we're talking about the DOJ and the FBI or whatever. We have processes in place to check what's happening. It just, it feels like, and I know I'm triggering a couple people when I say this, but it feels like it's, we use words like illegal or unconstitutional or not right when we really mean to say, I just don't like what's happening. And I really do think that a lot of these organizations are in like damned if you do, damned if you don't situations. I'm reminded a lot of Comey, who was a lifelong Republican, appointed by a Republican, who got accused by everybody of being a partisan hack for the Democratic side even though arguably him going public with the FBI findings of Hillary Clinton might have been the sole, not the sole reason, but might have been the tipping point for why she lost that election. But people will still say that he was a Republican stooge. But I think Comey is like, is, is emblemic of this, where he is, um, where, where he's a guy who is like, okay, the FBI is doing an investigation. If we don't say anything about Hillary Clinton, nobody in the public is going to trust us. We're, we're absolutely screwed. We're going to have, you know, these guys on stage saying that like, well, we rigged the investigation. We didn't find anything. I have to, even if we're not recommending charges, I have to come out publicly and make a statement. And he did that to arguably the detriment of the Clinton campaign. But that, again, that was like a damned if you do if you don't. He, he came out, he made a public statement. Hillary was basically indicted in the public eye. I don't know if either of you have complained about that, but she essentially was. And, she, and there was a lot of blowback, I think, from Comey's pretty damning statements about her, even though it really wasn't his capacity to say anything. So again, I, it always feels like a damned if you do, damned if you don't. I think there's not going to be like a silver bullet way to ensure transparency in any of these like investigatory bodies because the nature of what they do it, you know, makes everything so hard to just see it perfectly and clearly and not have it affect one outcome or another. At the time, I had Trump derangement syndrome, so just like you. So. Um, Real quick, though, we have, we have... Yeah, well, okay, go ahead, go ahead, good. Never mind. I was just going to say that, you know, you, you're glad that I changed my language about, uh, and this is going to be personal. So we've now changed, oh, possibly, like, possibly, blah, blah, blah. That just means I don't like. Well, you keep saying I blanket generally don't believe that this could possibly be happening. Uh, normalcy bias is a thing, too. Okay, so, you know, I, I suggest that things that are illegal are very likely happening, and you want me to adjust that. So let's work on the normalcy bias, too. It turns out right. corruption can happen, is happening. Go ahead. I think Ms. Klein has it correct. Uh, self-interest, we can trust people to act in their self-interest. There seems to be a disconnect in the original mission intent and self-interest of these agencies. Mm. So how is the best way, short of abolishing them, uh, to bring them back to that mission intent? 
I think it has to do with the culture and the incentives. So if they are incentivized to always win and be right, then you know that's what they're going to do. I think they shouldn't be rewarded for necessarily finding someone guilty. I think that like scientifically speaking, your experiment doesn't work 98% of the time, which is our conviction rate. So if there should be a more of a culture of rewarding evidence, justice, and even upholding uh, innocent until proven guilty. And, and even if you think the person is guilty but you can't prove it, then so be it. But, but my experience and understanding of, of kind of the mindset is that by any means necessary, if we think this person is bad and a criminal, then we'll do whatever it takes and the ends justify the means, and that needs to change. To Nikki's point, uh, you know, Kyle's law is actually a good example of this, where they're actually flipping the incentives. Where, you know, let's say you have a, you know, prosecutor who wants to destroy someone's life because they disagree with, you know, the nature of self-defense at all. Uh, you know, putting a, something in like Kyle's law, which actually allows them to recoup, uh, you know, a bunch of the costs and things like that for for the for the victim. Uh, I think. Things like that are actually uh, so consequences. Those are those are good. Those are good things you can put in that actually uh, affect the uh, the what's the word? Incentives? The incentives. Yes. Thank you. All right. Go ahead. Um, so I'm I'm in complete agreement that if the FBI um, targets somebody and pretends to be a 13 year old girl and that's not entrapment because I believe if a pedophile goes online that's rens rea guilty mind. However, with the Whitmer plot, for example, they have posted things that I hate Whitmer, I want her to resign, I think she should be out of office. They now target those people. Do you think that the core issue, what we're facing and what the detriment of it is people taking the FBI, for example, taking free speech and turning it into mens rea, guilty minds, so we must investigate you? I mean, I, I absolutely think that can happen. I don't, I don't know that that's true in in all cases, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, hello, hello, Destiny. I would like to thank you for coming here, and it's really good to have your, you know, another opinion. You know, I find it, it's a very interesting opinion, I'll, I'll tell you that much. Um, the first thing I'd like to tell you is that um, you were bringing up the, um, the, uh, the, the pedophile cases with that, I forgot what his name is. Off Hansen, the Chris Hansen. A lot of those guys walked because it was found to be entrapment. I, I think there were a couple, but I don't think there the majority was a, of them the did. The majority of them walked. Okay, I'll look at a up couple afterwards. Of them, a couple of them did get sentenced. You, are, you get a whole bunch of them, and, and that was actually had to do a whole issue of why his show got nixed, was because of the legal ramifications regarding it. Yes, yes. Um, and I was just wondering, on, on um, as far as the Whitmer case is concerned, and, and considering accountability, should entrapment be considered for some of these FBI agents that were involved in that case. I haven't read enough on the Whitmer case itself to make. That's why I'm not making any like precise statements about it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be able to say. I can't comfortably answer. I think that. it should Might be make considered. a good show. I think yeah, it should thanks. be considered. Uh, this question is largely for James, uh, but but as a person who believes in limited government, myself, why do we believe that any reconciliation with those who believe in unlimited government? is possible or desirable. I mean, let them have their Putins and Hitlers. They want them. I want a constitution, and they want Putin and Hitler. Let's just separate and go our separate ways. So the national divorce idea, this is actually where I part ways with a lot of people that describe themselves as new right. I do not support the national divorce whatsoever. I actually think that the premise of the United States is that people should be able to have different opinions. Believe it or not, I might be one of the most anti-woke or anti-Marxist people on the planet, and yet I think that con uh, communists are fully constitutionally protected and should be able to make their arguments, et cetera, in this country. That is their belief, that's their religion, and is the, that is their First Amendment right. Uh, now, national divorce is another matter, and I just think it's a bad idea because I actually believe in the union for kind of a principled reason. I understand the I don't want to share a country with these people sentiment, but my 
hesitation on a national divorce is virtually entirely practical. Um, in fact, no, my abject fear of a national divorce is entirely practical. We have a gigantic nuclear arsenal in this country. The second we enter into that level of political turbulence, you're going to see a UN declaration that the US nuclear arsenal is no longer safe, is no longer secure, and we're going to have to have Chinese and UN forces come in and help secure the United States. The goal of the operation that we're under is to split the United States. So why in the world should we help them? Once the United States splits politically, you can't say, oh, well, the silos happen to be in Texas. Therefore, those are red state nukes. And sorry, New York, you don't have that many. And That's I, not how that is going to work. And I will direct you to um, last year's panel. You can find it on YouTube at Myth and Four Milwaukee, where we talk about a national divorce. And check it out. But go, last question. I actually have a couple of questions. One for just one. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. then I guess the question we is. We only have an economy of time. Understood. Um, as Apollo far as the woke ideology that is creeping into these three letter agencies and so on and so forth, how do we go about putting the axe in those and putting a stop to it so that we can trust them again? So what's really funny is all I actually wanted to talk about on this panel, which never came up, was the fact that I Googled a lot of these. Virtually every three-letter agency, whether that's a traditional what we think of law enforcement type, CIA, NSA, DIA, whatever, you know, FBI, or whether it's one of these other kinds of uh, administrative state entities like the CDC, or if we even get to these departments that have cabinet positions like the Department of Education, uh, you know, and so on. That's a very broad definition of three-letter agencies, but virtually every one of them has another three-letter entity within it, a counter-hegemonic one, you might say, if you understand your Antonio Gramsci, which is called its Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And I don't trust any entity that has a diversity, equity, and inclusion office has any authority or power over that entity whatsoever, because I understand what diversity, equity, and inclusion represents. I understand where it came from. I understand the theory behind it. We don't have a lot of time to get into it. But at the end of the day, either the entity is on board with that ideology, in which case I absolutely cannot trust them because it's a nightmare in the making, or it's too stupid to understand what it's implementing full bore, in which case I cannot trust them because they are too stupid. So they're either incompetent or they're evil if they're implementing a DEI office. And every single one has this. I still, well, the main thing I actually wanted to say on this whole panel, it was one sentence, I'm still absolutely shell-shocked from these promo videos the CIA put out last year where you literally had whatever it was, a woman, a Latino woman or something walking around and she's describing her life and they made these like cool high production value videos and the woman's like blah 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 and I don't care about her life features but then she says I have generalized anxiety disorder then blah 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 I am the CIA and I'm like no no, and why is she, why is somebody with generalized anxiety disorder being promoted as the ideal CIA agent in a promo reel put out by the CIA? That's like exactly the thing that the psychological assessment should have screened out. But the answer is because what they're actually promoting is the diversity, equity, and inclusion ideology that they've accepted. So somebody with anxiety disorder is diverse. Uh, nuance bro wants the last yeah, word. So Special counsels, IG reports, that's, you know, there's no one thing, but w one thing I was a big fan of that, you know, Trump actually did this was to kind of start decentralizing or not having them all these agencies, these three-letter three agencies in Washington, D.C. at the seat of power. You know, he put, like, uh, Bureau of Land Management in Grand Junction, Colorado, having it actually closer to the source of Bureau of Land Management uh, land. I think it'd be good if we could do this with more agencies and have them not all in this, you know, in the swamp, shall we say, you know, where they can be like easily accessed by lobbyists and all of the, the corrupt power. So I think if it was more dispersed, decentralized, uh, I think that would be a good way to, that's, that, that's one way I think you could uh, help some of these problems. All right, cool. So we're coming up on a break. We have an hour and a half this time. Um, for an early lunch or dinner, or whatever you want to call it, since it's 3.45. But at 5.15, we will resume, unless I'm missing anything that Mikey might want to say. Uh, go ahead, get something to eat, and uh, we'll meet us back in a bit. Thanks. Thank you.